You know, we are ahead of schedule, is what I've been told. And the task I was given was uh, to get us back on track. So I don't know what that means. That means I keep you ahead of schedule. I, t I take more than 30 minutes. Uh, but those of you that are sitting in the back, if unless you're working on your laptops or your tablets, come on up. We can have a conversation. Uh, let me tell you, come on, guys. Unless you are the shy types, right? This is, uh, if you're a shy type, do not try to do a startup. That won't work. Because one of the characteristics of anybody who wants to be an innovator or a disruptor is you're willing to stick your neck out. And if you are a shy type, it's very hard to make it work. But let me tell you a little bit about. Uh, what do we do? What have I done uh, since uh, 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 since my life as a, a what I call a corporate weenie, uh, running uh, companies until uh, 2007, 2008, larger companies? Uh, we build businesses. It's very simple. It's my family office. We invest our own money. We own uh, startups from. Uh, a few percent to as much as a hundred percent. We have uh, seven or eight investments, largely in the telecom infrastructure. Uh, but we go up and down the value chain. We're not restricted. Uh, the benefit is we deploy our own capital to build the businesses. And many a times we do bring in outside capital. But uh, there are occasions when we keep the hundred percent ownership of the business or close to 100%, not counting the management. Uh, so that's what we do. We are uh, all over the planet. We are from Asia to Africa, Europe, uh, uh, Latin America, North America. And, uh, and uh, our companies have, uh, we have raised over the last seven years probably uh, close to $8 billion in uh, different businesses. So. We are pretty diverse. We also have some very small investments to very large investments. OK, what I, you know, when I was asked to come and speak here, I said, what do we really talk about? And, uh, and I, I don't want to be walking up and down the ecosystem. Actually, I, I am going to walk up and down the ecosystem. But when I say this is the golden age of innovation and from an investor's perspective, a golden age of investment in the mobile ecosystem. I don't think, and I've been around this industry, my gray hair or lack of hair tell you that, uh, is for more than three decades. There's hardly been any time like this. Because what we have seen over the last years is one or two or three parts of the ecosystem getting impacted. What we haven't seen is every single part of the ecosystem needing innovation, needing creativity, and needing disruption. And it's not because suddenly the technology is happening here. I think technology is a part of it. The demand is absolutely insatiable. And services, applications, products, devices, appliances, all of those things are creating a demand on every single part of this ecosystem. And I'll walk you through where we see the innovation being needed, and hopefully through every part of it. And, uh, and I'll do it pretty quickly uh, over the next 10 minutes or so, and then open up to questions, if that works. So let's talk about what's happening in the physical infrastructure. Uh, we invest in this infrastructure. I love infrastructure. It's very predictable business. Uh, it yields. Uh, uh, nice returns to the investors, uh, to, but the fundamental part of the infrastructure is it's going to continue to change very rapidly. 
you're not going to replace a existing macro telecom infrastructure. You're going to densify it with small cells, FEM2 cells, in building, outside building, densification like you have never seen before. If you go out 20 years in the future, the transmitters and the receivers, the RAN network, will exist in every part of the physical infrastructure we know. The spectrum, and fortunately or unfortunately, we all have to live with the laws of physics. There is no more spectrum being made on the planet. God just hasn't destined it. So we are going to use the licensed spectrum. We're going to use the unlicensed spectrum. We're going to make them work together. Spectral efficiency, whether you go from 4G to 5G and, uh, uh, and beyond, we are going to push the limits on the use of every single hertz of spectrum as much as we can. So think of a, an urban environment where you have transmitters hanging off of every physical, every physical civic and civil infrastructure. Every light pole, every public toilet, every bus stop, everything that is out there because you need to keep densifying and splitting the cells. There's just not enough spectrum and just not enough spectral efficiency. Serious area of innovation requires significant capital but you will see a lot of innovation, a lot of investment, and a lot of fortunes getting made in this business. Let me talk about the networks. And we all know what's going on with the access network, the backbone network. I think the differences between the physical and the logical networks are going to go away. When I talk of communities, communities of a physical network, the resources that are available, cloud-based services, the resources that are available on your devices, how you can use it as a community, how you can use it as a social network, it is all needed because there just aren't enough resources. And obviously, densification leads to every single device, and you see a lot of innovation coming out of chipset manufacturers, equipment manufacturers, all of that. Let me talk about platform services. And we used to talk about location and the security and the search. And I mentioned platform services in two places, in vertical areas as well as the core ecosystem services. These platform services at the ecosystem level will become inherent in how every appliance and every device is used. They will not be optional. They actually should not be optional. Now, I'm going to come back to this in a minute. And when I talk about the verticals and how the verticals will really transform what we all see out there, I think what we are seeing is the generation zero of innovation in this industry. Because what is about to come is very dramatic because it is needed. Let me talk about appliances and devices. How many variables can one handle? You know, this is, there's a variable for almost every function from your blood pressure to running to your location to your watches. And we're going through first generation of consolidation, watches are going to bring it. Then you're going to go in and you're going to create another six variables, one for the left arm, one for the right arm, one for the second le left arm uh, variable and the third uh, right arm variable and putting it on your ring and on and on and on. It's going to get consolidated. And actually, I would say, who needs a watch anyway? It's the old fogies like me carrying watches. Watches are useless. How many times do we even look at the watch? So why are we creating the next generation of watches? What's wrong with an appliance like this or another version of this? Do we really need them? And like every industry, you will see creation of a lot of these devices. You will see consolidation of these devices. Look, this is a, this consolidated camera phones, cameras, 
music, voice and data and all of those things and good part of your entertainment. What are we doing now? We are splitting it up and creating multiple of these. What will we do now? We'll consolidate. That's the next step. And what will we do again? We'll go out and create 20 of these all over. But that's normal evolution of the industry. And there's a lot of innovation that can be done. Big opportunity. You will see specific applications tailored to specific services, specific industries in the enterprise area. And then you will see a series of consolidation. And you know, it's all about data. There is nothing more critical than the data. And I, it, I get bashed. Sometimes I say, a data about an object is more important, and if I may say, more valuable than the object itself. And I'm going to take it one step further, which is I get bashed a lot about this. I say, a data about a human behavior many a times is more valuable than a human being himself or herself. That's a very tough thing to say. But what is the data about me as a human being worth? It is about how much I can spend, how much wealth I can create, how much value I can provide. That's what the data about me is all worth. So the, easily, the easy way to calculate this is say, a value of a human being equates to the value of the data that is about the human being. That's a pretty uh, harsh statement to make, but it's all about data. And this is a, there's a massive barrier to get in. We are all looking at specific vertical slices of the data today. It's what's in the cloud, what already exists. But there's a lot of data that is getting generated right now as we are sitting here. Where is it all going? It is somewhere in a digital form. We are all trying to get access to it. I think something that we know as privacy will almost vanish. There'll be security around it, privacy, any, phys any, any physical act that is done by a human being and has a digital impression, there is no privacy around it. Absolutely not. But this is an area full of opportunity. I think we're just beginning to scratch the surface. And now I'm going to go back, as I promised you. I'll come back and link the network part of this with the data and the analytics. Now think about our behavior. And I'll take a very simple example of the data I send to, or the files I share with, or the emails I send to. I send those to a set of people in my community. That's my either social network or a community that I created. It's all, not only it is existent data, but it's all very predictable. My behavior, that what do I do over the weekend? What do I do Saturday morning? What do I do Saturday afternoon? What do I do Monday afternoon? What do I do Monday morning? Can all be predicted. Could we design networks around that? Could we allocate network capacity around it? And if you happen to know for one individual, can you know for 10, 100, a million, 10 million? Absolutely, it's a very predictable phenomenon. And are you configuring the networks dynamically? Is the data from the cloud translating into how the network behaves and how the network capacity is created? Now, this may sound far-fetched, but all that data does exist today. There is absolutely zero creation of the data it is all that is in the networks. It is all whether they're physical telecom networks, they are in your HLR, they are in your VLR, these are in the sessions you create, they're part of your social networks, part of the communities you have. It's all existing data. And it's hugely valuable, but massive barriers of entry, but great value creation opportunities for innovators and disruptors like yourselves. And I'm going to make one example, and then I'll stop, because I have 10 more minutes to go. I was talking to Shankar earlier, and he happens to be in the logistics business. Uh, and I'm going to say something. If, if we were for a minute to think about the transformation industry verticals are going to have, 
And I were to say that Uber actually is not really an application but a platform service for transportation. And I'll give you an example. Think about an Uber driver who has driven 500 miles that day or 700 kilometers that day. He or she is more prone to accidents. The insurance needs to go up. The, uh, the car needs to be repaired, needs to go for service, all of that. It's all very predictable data. Who needs it? Well, the automobile manufacturer needs it. The scheduler needs it. You may say, look, if you've been around, you've driven 500 miles, I want you to get off. Either you cut them off or you reduce the prices. You reduce the prices, the utilization goes up. So you have to figure that out. Now you say, why is it limited to a, an on-demand car hire service? Can we take the same play platform services in the transportation industry and expand it? I'm not marketing Uber here, uh, so th th that's not my intent. I think the point I'm trying to make is we are really in the very early stages of creating mobile-centric applications. And each one of the industry verticals will need platform applications. And most industry verticals today do not have platform applications. Whether it's logistics, whether it's finance, whether it's healthcare, media, entertainment, YouTube could be, it's not today, but could be that platform for mobile. But YouTube was not designed for mobile. YouTube was designed for a fixed internet world. And candidly, they haven't transitioned very well. Are we going to see a next generation, a media platform created for mobile? Or is something like YouTube going to transition over? So this is, to me, when I look at applications, products, services, either to build or to invest in, we say, does that product have an opportunity to be a platform service? And I think the next few years, you're going to see a lot of services applications, the ones that are really successful to eventually become the platform services. And then you'll see specific vertical slices on top of it. So I'll stop here. Look, I think this is the next 10 years, and we were only here to talk about the next four years. Next 10 years are probably the most exciting time in this industry we have seen so far. I can't tell you how it'll be 20 years. Uh, from now, but I've been here in this space for over 30 years now. And we played all sides of it and uh, played it reasonably well. But this is the first time we are seeing opportunities up and down the ecosystem and opportunities to disrupt what exists today. So I'm going to stop here and open it up to questions and answers. And I have plenty of time. Seven more minutes. Any questions? Comments? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Thank you. This helps. If you have a, you have a, you have a kid coming out of college now, and where would you point that, that kid and you know, looking at all these different segments? you know, for the next 10 years as, as you see it? Look, I'm going to give you a, an answer that somebody, I asked the same questions, an answer somebody gave me 35 years ago or almost 40 years ago when I was ready to go to college, is what do you enjoy doing? And I'll tell you, this is, we were hearing it earlier, I like fixing things. I, I really love solving problems. So, depends on where your interests are. This is the esoteric non-answer that I'm about to give you. But look, if you love transportation industry, I'd say go hone in on it. But think of it very differently, because today's answers that exist today have solved yesterday's problems. Think about a world where our, uh, you know, this is, I can't speak to my children, they're grown up, they all both drive, but their kids may not ever need to learn how to drive a car. They may never need to learn that. So the transportation problems that the, the solutions are fixing today, it's a totally new generation of problems. 
Are we even thinking about it? What are the services you need in a connected and almost, almost driverless automobiles? I don't think we are beginning to scratch the surface. So I would say, how far ahead can a kid really think? If somebody's graduating out of college, one of my children graduated a year and a half ago, my answer to him was, and uh, this is, which direction do I go to? I say, how far can you think ahead? Because what you look in the past is yesterday's problems, truly are yesterday's problems. I tell you, my black car service usage when I travel has dropped by 90% because I use Uber or a service like that. I'm, again, I'm trying not to market Uber, but a service like that. Now, what do you do for somebody like me? I was told that there are 40,000 rooms in Paris using Airbnb. What are the platform services that are created around it? Will they eventually get taxed? You know, I'm not a taxing authority. I think the structure will change. So you have to, you know, what area can you focus on? This is specialization all over again, but don't fix yesterday's problems. Because the biggest failing of our educational institutions is they are telling us how it exists today and how yesterday's problems were solved. This is what we learned. This is all of us here learned. There's nobody, very few institutions that challenge you to think about how the world is going to be. How many schools are designing solutions? How many students are designing solutions for driverless cars? Just think of the world. Transportation, where there are no, no human drivers. So I'm sorry I didn't give you a direct answer. I would say pick, a, pick an area that interests you, but don't think of today. Because if you think of today, you're only incremental. What else? Wow, that was easy. So what are you guys investing in? What are you guys developing? Let me ask you. If you don't want to ask me a question, I'll ask you guys a question. This is a shy group. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It was great to be here. Have a good afternoon.